Well, good evening, everybody. Good to see everyone this evening. We're going to be talking about the Tower of Babel this evening. Before we get into that, though, I'd like to go back and just talk about a few things from our last study of Noah. And, uh, of course, we won't take the time to get through all of that. We basically covered two chapters of a four-chapter story. Just a few highlights from last week. Uh, we noted that the world before the flood looked a lot different than the world that we know today. And uh, I was just a little bit of a rabbit trail here. I was uh, studying the story of Cain and Abel with the church at Fayette on Sunday. And uh, we were talking about the mark of Cain. And one brother suggested, might the mark of Cain been uh, abnormally tall height? And that kind of hit me because, you know, there's giants in the earth there in Genesis chapter 6. And that certainly would be a reason not to want to attack Cain, right? <laughs> if he, he's a big hulking guy, I, I think that would be a deterrent. Anyways, I thought that was kind of interesting. And maybe that might give us some explanation for these Nephilim or these giants that we see pop up in Genesis chapter 6. We also noted in that story that sin has downstream consequences, and, and by that I mean that our sins impact more people and more things than just ourselves. And that's one lesson that I think God drives home in these first few chapters of the book of Genesis, that the world is cursed because of our sins, and that creation is in a sense paying a price because of man's iniquities. So remembering that and remembering that this world is, is futile by design, that God has programmed these things, he's programmed decay and futility into this realm in order to help us want something greater, want something better, want something that's eternal and not subject to these things, uh, is, is, good, is a good lesson to, to draw out. We also see that the, uh, the flood forecasts the judgment that is to come. This is the way that Jesus talks about it in places like Matthew 24. It's the lesson that Peter <clears throat> draws out in 2 Peter chapter 3, that if God destroyed the world with water, then why is it so hard to believe that one day he's going to destroy everything with fire. So the flood shows us that judgment is coming, that as we talked about last week, God is long-suffering, but he's long-suffering to a point. There is a point at which his patience wears out. And uh, obviously we haven't reached that point yet, but uh, could very well be that we'll see that point arrive in our lifetime, or it may be five or six centuries from now, who knows. We also see God making a new covenant with Noah and his descendants after the flood is concluded. And that covenant is that he will never again destroy the earth with water. That covenant is signified by the rainbow, which is a symbol of God's fidelity or faithfulness. One thing I didn't mention last week, when uh, John is before the throne of God in Revelation chapter 4, the throne of God is, is depicted as being surrounded by a, an emerald uh, or a green uh, rainbow. And that rainbow is symbolic of God's faithfulness, his fidelity, that God, when God makes a promise, we can be sure that he's going to follow through. He's going to keep his word. And that's what the rainbow symbolizes. And then the final thing we talked about last week is God establishes capital punishment for taking another person's life. And it, it seems to me that this is probably one of the, uh, the, the limits that God puts in place following the flood that hopefully will help curb mankind, that, won't, that if we have this in place, that this will help prevent us arriving at a point where the world is so violent that God feels the need to destroy it again. And I think we're gonna have something similar happen tonight. I think what we see happening after the flood is God putting certain safeguards in place to help restrain man, that, that it will help slow us down, so to speak, because otherwise we're likely just to, to run away, just like the folks did before the flood. 
So those were just a few of the lessons we talked about last week. Any questions or comments? Anything you guys want to explore about the flood? Or are we ready to move on to the Tower of Babel tonight? Everybody ready to move on? We good? All right. Well, let's get into Genesis chapter 11. But uh, before I get into Genesis chapter 11, I do want to just talk a little bit about Genesis chapter 10, which is the chapter in between the flood and the Tower of Babel. We're not going to go into a lot of detail about this chapter because it's a lot of names. And uh, it can be a little confusing to read through these names. But there are some important lessons to draw out of Genesis chapter 10. It's often called the Table of Nations. And what it is, is God's record of how the nations of the earth divided up after the flood. There, of course were three sons of Noah who were preserved by the ark, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And from those three sons emerged 70 cultures or nations or ethnicities. I don't know how, what word resonates with you, but that's, there's a few different ways you could describe this. So from these three sons emerged basically 70 nations. And just incidentally, there's some nice symmetry that happens here. There's 70 nations that emerge from the flood. There are 70 descendants of Abraham who end up down in the uh, land of Egypt during the time of Joseph. And that's actually something that's drawn out by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. So there's some nice symmetry there. 70 Gentile nations, so to speak, 70 descendants of uh, Abraham were preserved from that terrible famine that was affecting that part of the world. Anyways. We also see in the Table of Nations, perhaps most importantly, the origins of the Jewish people. And of course, they they descend from Shem through his son Arphaxed, his son Shelah, and his son Eber. And I have Eber italicized and underlined because Eber is the name from which we get the word Hebrew. Can you kind of see how we get that? Eber, Hebrew. So anyone who's a descendant of Eber would be a Hebrew, so to speak. Shem is where we get the word Semitic. And that's a word we're hearing a lot right now because of all of the stuff happening over in Israel and all the protests happening here in America. We're hearing anti-Semitic a lot. And that's a term for people who are antagonistic toward the Jewish people. They are prejudiced, antagonistic toward them, anti-Semitic. So the word Semitic comes from the name Shem. But if you think about it, there's a lot of Semitic people. (laughs) I mean, it's a pretty big family uh, based on what we read in Genesis chapter 10. But there's one particular descendant I want to note. Kind of sounds like a pirate. He's a guy by the name of Peleg, right? One was named Peleg because in his day the earth was divided. And I think what that means is when Peleg was alive, this was the time that God divided the earth up into nations, which is what we're going to read about in Genesis chapter 11. Really, Genesis chapter 10 is sort of a, it's sort of an anticipation of what happens in chapter 11. Chapter 11 explains how all of these families, the reasons why all these families divided up, but we're told about these families in Genesis 10. So in the days of Peleg, the earth was divided. Some people have speculated that there was continental divide during that time. I don't, I don't uh, go with that interpretation. I just simply think that this is, it was during this time that the Tower of Babel was built and God divided the world up by languages, nations, cultures, or ethnicities. Now, just to kind of get an idea of the, the region of the world we're talking about, this, this map, I think, is helpful because it, uh, it, it shows us these three families. You've got the, the family of Japheth, which settles up in this era, area. And Japheth are the, we might say, the Indo-European peoples. Okay, Down here, we have the family of Ham settling here in, um, not only in Africa. Whoops, I lost my little pointer there. Let's try this again. Whoop. Try that. There we go. You can kind of see all of Ham's descendants there, and there's a few more over in here. But then you've got Shem's family over this direction. And, I mean, these are rough approximations. Some of these names are very difficult for us to track down. Like, for example, uh, um, some of the ones that are a little bit more difficult to, uh, 
to determine who they who they represent. Like, um, let me find one here. Uh, dun, dun, oh. Yeah, we know who all those. Like down here, there's a there's a descendant by the name of Raama. Well, who's that? I mean, what what nation does that represent? We know that Sheba down here in Dedan, they represent the Arab peoples. We think the Arab tribes probably came from, from those folks, but it's a little difficult to know like who the Raama people, uh, the, who his descendants were. So some of these names are pretty easy to track down, but some of them are a little bit confusing. Uh, so anyways, that map just kind of shows you how everything sort of began to settle out after the, uh, the Tower of Babel and the nations were divided up into various nationalities and families. One particular uh, person that I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about because he has a part in our story tonight, although his name is not mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. It's a guy by the name of Nimrod. I don't know that this was his name. This seems to actually be more of maybe a nickname, maybe more of a description of, of his character. Nimrod was not a very good man, and there's really two things I'd like to note about Nimrod. First of all, he was a valiant warrior, but he was also known as a mighty hunter. And if you look into the Hebrew word for that uh, word hunter, it actually implies that he was a hunter of men. So here we have a, a man who we might call bloodthirsty. He's a warrior. He's a great conqueror. And if you look at all the cities that he started and ruled over, these are some of the major cities of, of the ancient world there in the Fertile Crescent. And we'll talk about some of those. Uh, we see in Nimrod the origins of the, the cultures that we now call the Sumerians, the Akkadians, and the Assyrians. And uh, Nimrod, it said, rules over the um, area called Shinar. Shinar is just a, an old name for the Babylonians, for southern Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamia, that word, if you go back to your junior high social studies classes, I think that that's when I first learned the word Mesopotamia. That's, that's the first time I can remember learning that word. The word Mesopotamia just means the, the land between the rivers. Of course, there's two major rivers in this part of the world. You've got the Tigris and the Euphrates. Of course, here's the Euphrates running right down through here. You've got the Tigris running down through here. And the land in between is called Mesopotamia because it's the land between the rivers. But I'd like you to notice here, um, we've got several cities. Whoop, I want to go back there. Come on. There we go. We have several cities to note. I can't get rid of my... My little drawing there. Yeah, we'll just have to go with it. But you'll notice along here in the in the uh, in this region of the world, we've got several cities of note. You've got the city of Ur. That's going to become important because that's the hometown of Abraham. Abraham was from Ur of the Chaldees. You also have the city of Babylon right here. And then uh, let's see. There was one more I wanted to point out to you. Well, oh, I've lost it now, so we're just going to keep on moving here because I can get. I can get down these little rabbit trails and <laughs> nobody will be interested except for me in this whole discussion. So anyways, that just kind of gives you a flavor of the region of the world we're talking about, the peoples that we're talking about. And Nimrod plays uh, an important role, even though his name is not mentioned in Genesis chapter 11. He is the builder of the city of Babel among many other major cities in this part of the world. So he's sort of in the background of the story. All right. I told you we're going to talk about Genesis 11. I've spent the last 10 minutes talking about Genesis 10. So now let's actually get into our text for tonight. But I thought there were a few things there that were worth bringing out. Okay. Genesis chapter 11. Now the whole earth had one language and one speech. And it came to pass as they journeyed from the east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar. That's the land of Babylon. And they dwelt there. Then they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. They had brick for stone and they had asphalt for mortar. And they said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top is in the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. 
Now, they intend not to just build a city, but also a tower. And in this region of the world, there were a lot of towers built. We call them ziggurats. This is a ziggurat from Ur. And let me pull my notes up here so I can uh, get this for you here. So this is a, a tower. And as best as we can tell, this was likely the sort of thing that they were building. This is a, a ziggurat in uh, what's known as Ur or Ur of the Chaldees. And now this isn't the, the tower that the Babylonians built. Let's just be very clear about that. This is just sort of an example of what it may have looked like. And I think that there's good reason to believe that it, it did look something like this. Because what we're going to notice, if I have time later on, we're going to notice that this type of architecture is all over the ancient world. Not just here in Mesopotamia, but also over in Egypt, clear over in Indonesia, in, uh, down in, uh, in our part of the world, in Central America, where the Mayans lived. These sorts of towers, these sorts of temples were built all over the world, and you're going to see a lot of similarities in their architecture. So this seems to be probably what they were building. And their motivation for building this tower was, we want to make a name for ourselves. That's a curious thing to say. And it's a little difficult to know what exactly they meant by that. But let's remember, we're within a few generations of the flood, a few hundred years of the flood. And human, humanity was basically wiped out by the flood. And the memory of those people was essentially wiped out by the flood. And what I think they mean by this is we don't want to be forgotten like those people who were wiped out by the flood. We want to be remembered. We want our children and our grandchildren and so on and so forth. We want them to remember us. And so we're going to build this city and this tower and we're going to establish our name here so that the same sort of calamity will not befall us. And in the book of Job, which Job was living pretty close to this time period, probably a couple of centuries after this, he was a contemporary with Abraham. In the book of Job, they talk a little bit about the flood. And this is what they say. Will you keep the old way which wicked men have trod who were cut down before their time? whose foundations were swept away by a flood. They said to God, depart from us. What can the Almighty do to them? And this seems to be sort of an expression of the spirit of those who lived before the flood, a spirit of defiance, of rebellion. And as mankind looked back, they did not want to see that repeated again. They wanted to defy God, so to speak, and we see defiance in this. When God comes down, oh, pardon me, I'm skipping ahead of myself here. A second reason why they were motivated to do this is because of this statement here. Otherwise, we will be scattered across the face of the entire earth. Now, if you've been following our study here for the last, hmm, what, six or seven weeks, you're going to immediately see something wrong with this sentiment. What's wrong with this? Well, this is a defiance of one of God's commands. They are defying God. Because what did God say to Adam and Eve when he created them and placed them in the garden? He said, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. He repeats that to Noah in Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. But that's not what these people were doing. What did they want to do? They wanted to stay together. They wanted it to remain unified. They didn't want to spread out. And this, I believe, was a, an expression of defiance. God wants us to do this, but this is what we want. We want to stick together. And we don't want to go along with God's will. So... In the Tower of Babel and in the building of this city, we see humanity's mission basically directly opposed to God's will. And of course, God takes note of this, doesn't he? In fact, he 
goes down to investigate. We're going to get into that in the next few verses. But I'll pause here. Ask any questions, comments. We doing good so far? Everybody all right? Do we want to go back and read all those names in Genesis chapter 10? Yeah, no, no. There's some, there's some tongue twisters in there, aren't there? Some real tongue twisters. Any questions or comments? We good to keep going? All right, let's keep moving. Genesis 11, verses 6 through 9. And the Lord said, Indeed, the people are one, and they all have one language, and this is what they begin to do. Now nothing that they propose will be withheld from them. Come, let us go down, and, and there confuse their language, that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of all the earth, and they ceased building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there, the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of all the earth. So God, in a sense, visits this city. And one of the things that he notes is with all of these people united by a single language living in the same place, nothing that they propose to do will be withheld from them. And we'll talk about this a little bit more here in a couple of minutes. But what this teaches us is... The diversity of peoples and languages that we have all across the globe is actually a good thing. Now that seems, that, that seems strange to say, but it actually is for humanity's overall good that we are divided up like this. Because when the barriers of language are taken down, what does man tend to do? Well, man tends to go the opposite direction of God. I and mean, that's really the lesson that I think is being driven home here in the Tower of Babel. And God says, let us go down and take a look at all of this, which that whole use of us makes me think, is this another reference to the Trinity? It kind of sounds that way, doesn't it? Let us make man in our image is what's said back in Genesis chapter 1. I think that's verse 26. Let us go down. Could be another reference to the Trinity. And God proposes to do two things. He's going to take two interventions. The first thing he's going to do is he's going to divide humanity into nations by language. So he's going to end this unification movement, so to speak, this intent to remain in the same place, united, working toward the same goal, but a goal that is in opposition to God. So he's going to take care of that problem by dividing all the nations, dividing all the people into nations by language. And then he's going to scatter them across the earth. And again, I think this is God's, uh, not his attempt, but these are steps God is taking to safeguard man from allowing us to get back to the point we were before the flood. The flood is, in a sense, a reset of human history. And God is putting certain safeguards in place that are intended to slow us down, speed bumps, if you will, so that we will not run away from him. And if you think back, what is said about mankind prior to the flood? We talked about this last week. Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. What's happening in the Tower of Babel? Well, we just kind of see the same sort of thing, right? What are they intending to do? They're using their imagination and their imagination is taking them further and further away from God. So God divides them up and his intent in dividing them up dividing us up, I should say, is to actually draw us closer to him. By moving us further apart from one another, he's actually drawing us all closer to him. And that's a message that Paul preaches on Mars Hill at the Areopagus in Acts chapter 17. And we're going to talk about how we see several instances in the New Testament where the effects of Babel are basically reversed. But we find here in Acts chapter 17 how it was actually God's, by God's design, in order to draw man to him that he divided, that, that this is the reason why he divided us up into nations. Sorry, I'm kind of having a hard time expressing that idea. Let's just go ahead and read this. 
And he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as also some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Now there's a lot packed into this short little statement. So let's kind of take this apart piece by piece starting at the end and working our way backwards. So Paul acknowledges that even among the Greeks, there was this understanding that all of humanity, we we are all children of God. We are all the offspring of God. And that we all depend upon him, for in him we live and move and have our being. So we depend utterly upon God for our existence. And God has divided the world up into their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. That's a really fancy way of saying everybody's been divided up into their own nations. But there's a purpose. And the purpose is nestled right in the middle of all of this. And the purpose is right here. So that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grow for him and find him. This division that God has created on the earth by driving us further apart from one another, is intended to actually draw us closer to him. So, you know, diversity is something, as Americans, that we live with. We're not a homogenous society at all, like other countries in the world. So we're more accustomed to diversity, but diversity has its downsides. And one of the downsides to diversity is it tends to take us further away from God. Pardon me, unity tends to uh, take us away from God. Diversity is actually a good thing, but really when you live in a diverse culture, we're all kind of trying to work together, right? We're all trying to be unified, and what does that tend to do? It tends to take us away from God. And that's not a terribly popular or politically correct opinion, but you got it from me tonight. So here it is. This is the opinion or the judgment of the, of the scriptures that these divisions are actually for our good. So dividing the earth into nations and languages curbs human rebellion against God. That's at least what I see in this story and something that we can take home and and, uh, take to heart. That while it would be nice to be able to speak other languages and be able to communicate with other people or maybe have the world united by a single language, although technically we kind of are united by a single language right now, the language of binary, which when you start to think about that can really take you down some really scary rabbit holes pretty quick, but that's a whole other discussion for another time. Anyways, these divisions are actually for our good and it leads us closer to God. All right, I'm gonna stop here for a moment and take a breath. Any questions or comments? Tammy, is that a hand or is that just a, okay, oh, no, I I was really hopeful there. I know you got good things to say, so, all right. No, Darl's got something, all right. So, so, uh, man's nature is to, uh, uh, not all man's nature, but there is about acquiring power Hmm. and uniting people together. If we look at the great or infamous people that tried to do that, take over the world. Hmm there would be more of a tendency if you had one language for that to happen, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because with the diversity, that's always where the battles come from. Yeah. And then that would be, in my sense, man would say, we are God. We are heaven. We mm-hmm. are unified. Mm-hmm. And that's not what we're here on earth for. Yeah. And I mean, that seems that yeah it does it absolutely does yeah and and there have been attempts to sort of unify multiple nations uh, you know under a single language i'm thinking of the 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 catholic church in the middle ages which insisted that all of the services be conducted in latin um, that the scripture could only be read in latin by a priest so that that's that's an attempt to sort of of create a a um artificial unity and bind different nations together and 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 what does that do well it's it's uh it's an attempt to um i can't think of the word here but 
you know, it, it, it creates a, oh boy, there's this word that's right on the tip of my tongue that I can't think of. Hegemony. It creates a hegemony, right? So it creates this, this center of power that cannot be defied. So yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's one thing that diversity does guard against. Absolutely. Good thought. Other thoughts? All right. Well, one of the interesting things, and I alluded to this uh, a moment ago, one of the interesting things, one of the interesting messages that we see in the New Testament is, I guess you might say, a, a way to sort of reverse the effects of Babel. And uh, have you ever thought why God distributed the gift of speaking and interpreting tongues? Well, I think there's actually a reason behind this that, that goes beyond more the practical side, right? There's a practical component to this. This would have allowed the church to spread the gospel very quickly in the first century. If you have an apostle, say you have a Thomas who goes over to India and he begins preaching in India, it would be very useful for him to be able to speak the local dialects in order to preach the gospel. So there, there is a, a practical side to this gift, but... I think there's also something maybe symbolically happening or spiritually happening because the ability to speak in tongues is basically sort of a reversal of what happened at the Tower of Babel, if you think about it, right? Because all of a sudden, because of this gift, it doesn't matter where you live or where you're from, that you have a single message, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that can be spoken to anyone anywhere. It's a breaking down of a barrier, so to speak. And I, I think that may be one of the reasons behind God giving this gift. It wasn't just a, a, a practical, I mean, it was a practical gift, but it wasn't just for practical purposes. That this is God's way of basically reversing what happened at Babel. And they were filled with the Holy Spirit. This is Acts 2 verses 4 through 6. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. Now, to be clear, the miracle was in the speaking, not in the hearing. I've heard some people suggest that the fact that the public could hear them speak in their own language meant that they were given the miraculous ability to understand what the apostles were speaking, but that's not where the miracle took place. The miracle was that the apostles could speak in other languages, and that allowed them to communicate with people from all over the Roman world. You've got people from at least, if I recall correctly, at least 16 different uh, provinces or nations within the Roman Empire at this time. They've all got their own dialects. Uh, of course, a lot of them are going to be able to speak Greek because that was sort of the English of its day. But the fact that they could hear the apostles speaking their own language was powerful. And that enabled Peter to preach Jesus Christ crucified and resurrected and extend to them the invitation to obedience to the gospel. So this is God's way of basically taking Babel and turning it around. That the true unity that we can achieve, the unity that can break down walls, the unity that can break down barriers, happens in Jesus Christ. That's where we can unify. And that's the message that Paul preaches in the book of Ephesians. I've got kind of a lengthy quote here, but I think this really speaks to this particular point. Therefore, remember that you once Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision by what is called the circumcision made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenant of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And he came and preached peace to you who were afar off and to those who were near. For through him we both have access by one spirit to the Father, now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Now, in the immediate context of this passage, Paul is talking about the, the, 
the barrier that was between Jew and Gentile, between circumcised and uncircumcised, and how that barrier in Christ is removed, that we're all one people now. But that's even true when we extend it out and we talk about the diversity of nations among the Gentiles, that in Jesus Christ, these walls can be broken down. And if you ever have the chance to travel to a foreign country, I encourage you to find a church of Christ in a foreign country and go visit. And you will be amazed at your experience. You walk into these places and you might not speak the same language as these folks. They probably will be able to understand a little bit of English and may be able to speak a little bit of English with you. But what you're going to notice immediately is that you share something in common with these people. You share Jesus Christ. And that is powerful. It is powerful to, to meet someone for the first time and feel like you've known them your whole life. And that's the unity that we have in Jesus Christ. It breaks down these barriers that God put in place in order to keep us from destroying ourselves. But the true unity is achieved in Jesus, not through human attempts to unify. We can unify through Jesus Christ and not by our own means. So I, I see in the gospel God's way of reversing the effects of Babel. And I think that that's a very powerful message to take to heart. Any questions or comments? That's a bit of a rabbit trail, but we only had like 11 verses to cover tonight. So I, I needed to come up with a few other things to say about this. Anybody else got any questions or comments? Anything you want to add to what I've said so far. All right, picture time. Are you ready for some pictures? Here we go. This was that ziggurat I showed you earlier. This is the great ziggurat of Ur. And uh, I took this from Encyclopedia, the Encyclopedia Britannica. And uh, think back, if you will, to how the Bible describes them building that tower. Here's what the Encyclopedia Britannica says about this ziggurat. Its core was constructed with bricks made from mud and reed, pressed into molds and dried in the sun. Several million bricks were used for the core, which was strengthened with reed matting and sandy soil sandwiched between every six layers of brick. The core was clad with glazed bricks mortared with bitumen and to create a waterproof surface punctuated by weeper holes to allow water to evaporate from the center. That sounds, a, I mean, there's a lot more information there than we have in scripture, but it sounds a lot like what we're told about this tower that's built in the city of Babel. Does that look similar to that previous structure? Look close to the same? What do you think? Oh, I went back too far. There we go. What do you think? Pretty close? Yeah, it kind of does, doesn't it? Okay. You got this pyramid structure, right? What, what, this angle is not very good here, but you've actually got three staircases. You've got a staircase here, you've got a staircase here, and then there's one that's on the opposite side here. So if you look at, at, at a frontal view of this ziggurat, you'd actually see a staircase going right up to the top of the temple. And that's what's happening there, right? Kind of similar. This is the pyramid at the Suku Temple in Indonesia, which is an island just off of the coast of, uh, my geography in that part of the world is just not very good, but it's an island that's uh, basically south of China, if I'm remembering my geography correctly, okay? Different part of the world. What about that? Similar? Yeah. Anybody want to take a guess where that's located? This is in North America. This is the temple of Kukulkan. It's also known as El Castillo, a step pyramid that sits at the center of the Mayan city of Chichen Itza. Ah, yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. All right. There you go. Chichen Itza. Yeah. Do you see the similarities here? Looks pretty similar. What about here? 
Yeah? Yeah? This is uh, on the Canary Islands, which is just off of Spain. Uh, they don't know the origins behind this step pyramid. Uh, they've got some guesses, but no one really knows where they came from, who built them, etc. Um, they think maybe the indigenous people built them well before Spanish colonization, but they just really don't know. But here they are. What about this right here? Still looking pretty similar? This is in Cambodia. This is Prasat Prong, Kokare, Cambodia. So this is 53 miles northeast of Angkor Wat. You might have heard of that before. That's a huge uh, Buddhist um, uh, temple complex. This was built back in the 10th century, but you can kind of see some similarities in the construction. Notice the stairs going up. You got a step pyramid just like these other places. Interesting stuff, isn't it? I think I got one more. Yep, I do. This is in Peru. This is the sacred city of Corral Supeg in Corral, Peru. This dates back to about 2000 BC. Uh, there are six pyramids here and they were in use until about 1440 AD. Very similar construction. Notice you've got the pyramid structure with the stairs going up the center. Okay, what am I driving at with all of this? Well, I think it's interesting. Let me go back to this real quick. I just think it's interesting that we have all of these examples of similar architecture scattered all over the world. And basically what you have are people building mountains out of brick. Does that make sense? They come to the plain of Shinar and they want to build a tower, a tower that reaches up into the heavens. So you have this this, I guess you might say this association with we want to get closer to the divine. And that idea continues all across the world. You've got this, you've got people all over the world who are basically building mountains as temples. And I think that there may be a very good reason for this. And this is, this is uh, just some... Some interesting food for thought. Take this for what it's worth. It may just be worth thinking about more than anything else. In Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, Isaiah is prophesying about the, the kingdom of Christ that is to come. And he writes, Now it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be on, established on top of the mountains, and it shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow to it. Many people shall come and say, Come and let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, and we shall walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. The mountain of the Lord's house. Let's go up to the mountain of the Lord. Very interesting. Where did Moses go to receive the law? He went up to the top of Mount Sinai. Where was the temple built in the city of Jerusalem? On Mount Zion, right? There's three mountains or hills in Jerusalem and one of those hills, one of those mountains is where the temple was built. So you have this idea of the Lord's house being at the top of a mountain. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 22 through 24. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God, the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect, to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks of better things than that of Abel. That's one of my favorite passages in the entire Bible right there. But I love that first part. You have come to where? To Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem. God's dwelling place is described as a what? As a mountain. This is where his house is located. Revelation chapter 21, verses 15 through 17. John's taking a tour of the new heavens and the new earth. He has an angel who's talking with him. And he who talked with me had a gold reed to measure the city, its gates, and its walls. The city is laid out as a square. Its length is as great as its breadth. 
And he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. Its length, breadth, and height are equal. Then he measured its wall, 144 cubits, according to the measure of a man that is of an angel. So basically, the city of God is a cube. Did you notice that? Its length, its breadth, and its height are all the same. They're all 12,000 furlongs. Anybody got their conversion charts handy right now? How long is a furlong? Anybody know? It's an eighth of a mile. Okay? 12,000 furlongs is 1,500 miles. The city of God is 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles deep, 1,500 miles tall. But notice the wall that surrounds it is 144 cubits. What's a cubit? It's a foot and a half, right? So what's 144 cubits? Well, that's 216 feet tall. In other words, the wall is 216 feet tall. The city is 1,500 miles tall. The city is a mountain, basically, that's surrounded by a wall. The city is a mountain. Surrounded by a wall. What does God say about the king of Babylon in Isaiah chapter 14, verses 13 and 14? For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. This was the attitude of the king of Babylon. Some people think that this refers to Satan, but it's pretty clear uh, from what's said earlier in the chapter that he's actually talking about the king of Babylon in this chapter and not Satan, although I won't say that. Uh, but what I want to notice about this is the attitude. What's the attitude? By building this tower, building the city, what is the king of Babylon trying to do? He's trying to become like God, isn't he? And hasn't that always been man's pursuit? Why does man build these mountains in the middle of nowhere that all pretty much look the same? What are they doing? Well, they're trying to get closer to the divine, right? And that's a message that I think has its roots in Babel, in Babylon. I think that these are basically echoes of what mankind was doing clear back in the days just following the flood. And it's the spirit of Babylon that aspires to make man equal with God. That's what the Babylonians were attempting to do as they built this city and this tower. And it's been the spirit of Babylon ever since. You know, it's interesting in the book of Revelation, the book of Revelation really is a tale of two cities. You've got... The city of Jerusalem, the city of God, and then you also have Babylon, the harlot, the city that represents the rebellious among mankind. And I think all of that imagery is rooted back here in Genesis chapter 11. That's why these stories are so crucial, because we see God using these themes and reworking them and bringing them out in different places later on. I don't know that it had ever occurred to me that the gift of tongues on the day of Pentecost was a way of reversing the effects of Babylon until someone had said that recently, but that's absolutely what was happening. So all of these foundational stories end up coming back later on in really unique and I think very interesting ways. So, all right, I know that last little part was a bit of a rabbit trail, but I thought we'd have a little time and... Take it for what it's worth. I think it's worth thinking about. And I think uh, it's, it's interesting to consider. Logan, if I, if I log out of this, is that going to shut that off? Are you guys still seeing the keynote? Yep, yep, you guys are still seeing it, so. All right. <laughs> so... If everyone's not been there, Cahokia Mound in Illinois. Oh, yeah. Looks just like the Mayan in South America. Yeah. America. Then, There's something going on here, folks. Yeah. I mean, you have peoples that are separated by oceans in some cases, yeah. building similar structures. Yeah. 
I don't know. There's just something deep down inside of us, I think, that's, that's at least partially responsible for this. Because the coincidences are just, well, they're... They can't be coincidences. Because the common thing is trying to get higher. Trying to get higher, yeah. And if we don't have a mountain to go up, let's just build ourselves a mountain to get us closer to God, basically. Because the one we went to in Kapan in Honduras, there was a secret chamber in the back. Yes. Where the king would come up. Yes. In the fire. Yes. <laughs> so, yeah. There's, there's, yeah, and that's a common feature. They like the the pyramids in Egypt. They've got these these tunnels underneath them, right? And and. So do these Mayan pyramids as well. It's really interesting some of the similarities that are happening there. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, I, we're going to go down a whole bunch of weird roads here if we're not careful. So let's extend the gospel invitation. We're about to sing the song, As the Deer Pants for the Water. And this is speaking about our spiritual thirst, that there's something inside of us that knows that there's got to be more than life than what we see. There is a thirst or a hunger that we all have. And we have it to various degrees. But we know that something's missing. And as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes, God has set eternity in our hearts. And I think that that's what this song is speaking to. That we all have this hunger and this thirst that only God can fulfill. So let's stand and sing number 71. <laughs>